One of the many things that I love about this channel is how I have to think about these episodes in new ways for the sake of making these videos. Today's episode is a great example. A short, stout man is nailing a promotional poster to a tree on the Ponderosa, presumably hoping to attract some local wildlife to his company's play opening that night in Virginia City. Just in time, too. The bears were trying to fit some culture into their lives. Trout fishing can't be your whole day, you know? Alas, the Cartwright sons approach, guns in hand, with rope at the ready. The man, played by Hal Smith, is reduced to a blubbering heap on the ground as he fears he's about to meet his end, simply for doing his job, albeit rather badly. He tries offering them tickets to the best seats in the opera house and hastily drops them at their feet before fleeing, an act he will repeat every time we see him this whole episode. Hoss reads the poster while Joe sneaks the tickets into his pocket. He quickly flashes them at Hoss behind Adam's back, but Adam knows what's up. He's lived with these two long enough. His tiny little smile that he hides as he tells them to get back to work is a subtle detail by Prunell to let us know the boys aren't getting anything past older brother. That night, Hoss, in all his stealth, sneaks out the window and down the roof to an awaiting Joe. Can you just imagine the thud if he had fallen on his way down? Joe asks what took so long, and he says, and Hoss says Adam's door was open. He can be worse than Pa sometimes. Oh, I love that line, because any younger sibling can relate to it. Joe's line about how no one will recognize Hoss all cleaned up is another cute one that a younger sibling who likes to mess with the older ones can totally appreciate. In town, a gruff-looking man, played by Don McGowan, introduces himself as John C. Regan, former heavyweight champion of the world. A one-armed man, played by William Mims, taunts Regan and gives us the information that Regan can't get a fight anymore and is rather washed up. After getting him all angry, he sends his drunk friend after him, and the man gets used as a bar mop in exchange for all the liquor Regan can drink. What a pal. This won't be the first one-armed character to cause trouble, but that's another episode. Hoss and Joe are walking by the saloon when they hear the raucous and Hoss is tempted to join in but Joe reminds him that they don't get a chance to see this kind of play all the time. The bartender was holding a gun on Regan when he first found out who he was, but by the end of the fight, he's smiling at him like a proud fan in a boxing match. I guess it doesn't matter who you are so long as you make good business. When the boys get out in front of the opera house, Joe is pulled away by his collar off screen and the camera pans to Adam, all dressed up waiting for them. His patiently biding his time from the moment he caught Hoss snatching up the tickets really paid off, and I love that he kept his door open, probably on purpose. I can just picture his thought process that the open door would make Hoss more nervous. The boys are thrilled to find out that Adam isn't there to send them home, rather to sneak out right along with them, because older brother can be fun. The little man sees them taking their seats and again flees for dear life. Hoss doesn't have too much experience at the opera, so the concept of gender bending, that is, a woman playing a man's role, confuses him a bit. The play is Mazeppa, an opera based on the poem of the same name written between 1881 and 1883. In the play, Mazeppa is bound to his horse by the vengeful father of the woman he wishes to steal away with whilst wearing nothing but nude colored tights, as the character is supposed to be nude. Hoss gets rather animated, and he gets deeper in the uh, entertainment. As his brothers have to push him back in his seat, but not before he knocks down a man nearby. I think this part of the scene is a little hokey and makes Hoss look a little, for lack of a better term, simple. But it's over quickly, so I let it go. I just think that they get his inexperience across enough with the other scenes and they don't need this. If they were to cut it, we wouldn't miss a thing. After the play, the boys go for a drink in the saloon. Hoss asks both of his brothers if Ada had really been naked. I guess the best seats weren't really that good. By now, I think we're all starting to wonder how they all three snuck out of the house without Pa seeing, and in he walks, on the arm of none other than Miss Ada Isaac Mankin. She throws off her garter, and it is caught by John Regan, who we can see by Ada's face is no stranger to her. He watches as Ben takes her back to her hotel room, where they are kind enough to expose it to the audience over lobster and pheasant. Turns out that she and John used to date, and when he began losing his career, he sank into the bottle, causing him to beat her and take all the money she had to give him. Tough times really do show what a person is made of. 
In contrast, Ben's suffering never made him into a drunk or a domestic abuser. Ada kisses Ben before he leaves. When he walks out the door, we find out that Regan was already in the room. Some security she has. He's jealous, and she tries to tell him that Ben is just a friend, but he's not buying it. In the saloon, Ben appears to be playing cards with some other men, which seems very much unlike the Ben Cartwright we will come to know, but it's still early, and they were still shaping our main men at this point. We never get to see if Ben found out the boys were at the play, as the following scene is from the next day, while the boys are all hot and bothered. I mean that literally, of course. Stop thinking what I know you're thinking. We're here for women in tights playing male characters, not sweaty, angsty car rides, Dad burn it. They're all worried that Daddy might be dating. Joe finds out that the possible new mommy is coming to dinner that night, and he looks so little when he tells his brothers about it and the fact that Ben just up and moved in with her. Them both asking Adam what, they make, what he makes of it is so sweet. They probably both had many things happen in their childhoods where they turned to Adam to make sense of it all. Also, let's remember that Ben married Marie and brought her home as his wife before Adam and Haas knew she existed. So this idea of him just moving in with some woman they've never met probably weirds them out a little bit. That night at dinner, the boys say nothing and glare at this stranger seated at their table, who, incidentally, has some of the whitest teeth I have ever seen. Maybe she does make actress-level money, but she blew it all on teeth whitening kits before Reagan asked her for it, and before whitening kits were even invented. Hey, I'm not judging. She works hard for those dollars. The boys say nothing except for Adam, who is ever the trained gentleman, but only when there's no getting around it. The only thing he says that isn't pleasantry is that they protect what is theirs from outsiders. And whoa, boy, the shade. Savage. Daddy's already been married three times, okay? There's no need to do it again. Hopsing breaks the ice in the room by being his usual kind self to Ada. He's just happy to see Missa Ben happy. I swear, all this reminds me of that movie The Parent Trap, where the twin girls go on that camping trip with their dad's gold digger fiancé and absolutely torture her the whole time until she shows her anger and the dad dumps her. All I'm saying is that if this relationship had gotten any further, there's lots of places to get lost on the Ponderosa and Adam ain't playing. Before it gets to that point, the boys confront Ben for dating an actress, something that certain ones of them will go on to do themselves in the future. He tells them he's a big boy and he'll do as he pleases. He's gentle about it and keeps a smile on his face the whole time. I agree that he is a grown man and his grown kids don't have that much of a say. However, I do think it would have gone over better if he'd told them before that dinner was what was going on. Especially Adam, because later that night, after her performance, guess who was waiting in her dressing room? This time, her entourage knows about it and tells her they tried to stop him. But those intense hazel eyes, what were they supposed to do, man? His visit is short and very sweet. As he does one of those kisses with his arms wrapped around the girl that he's known for. You know the one I'm talking about, right? I just wonder if this has anything to do with her decisions made later in the episode. It cuts away so we don't actually know what else they talked about up there, and when he comes out, Hoss and Joe's inquiry is met with a curt, none of your business. Joe, ass Joe assumes that means Adam didn't make out so well, and, um, strictly speaking, he seems to have made out quite a bit. Joe takes his turn and brings room service complete with two bottles of champagne. She lets him flirt for a little while and asks him if he has many girls. He says one or two. It's early. Ask him again in season 14. Boy should have written an autobiography. That thing would have been a bestseller even further away than Virginia City. She makes him a little nervous as she acts like she's going to kiss him, and instead grabs him by his ears and throws him down, telling him what she didn't tell Adam. Ben only moved in to protect her. She doesn't realize yet that he has other motives besides chivalry. There's a knock and they both assume it's Ben. Joe takes off the back way, and the person at the door is Regan, who didn't bother breaking in this time. He's grown as a person, clearly. She offers to buy him out with the last few jewels she has left, and he refuses, but he takes the jewels anyway. 
Ben shows up and proposes right in front of him before running him off. In the moments just before Ben makes his presence known, we see a look on Ada's face that makes my heart sink. Because it is in this moment when I know that, for all his faults, she's still in love with him. She and Ben talk about the boys, and it's here that I start to respect her. She doesn't want to come between him and his sons, and she can tell that she will be doing that if she marries him. A fanfiction story I read one time made me think a little deeper about this scene, because they then talk about Adam being very much Ben's son. She doesn't tell Ben Joe was there. That very night, in fact. In this fanfiction, the question is posed that Adam caught feelings for Ada after that kiss. My mind begins to wonder if part of the reason why she turns Ben down is that she knows she'll catch feelings for Adam, and that would lead to disaster. If you want to talk about coming between a man and his son, falling for the son is a really great way to do it. Remember, the camera cut away after the kiss, and Adam didn't come out right away. What did they talk about? Regan had seen Joe in Ada's room and confronts him in an alley. The next time we see Regan, he's in the saloon where Hoss tries to befriend him, not knowing who he is. After Ben leaves Ada's room with his marriage proposal having been rejected, Hoss rushes into the lobby holding a badly beaten Joe. Adam is there shortly and they gather to see if the damage to his optic nerve has caused him blindness. The pain in each of the older three Cartwrights faces is a gut punch. The way Joe whines Pa several times and finally a tear streaks down his face when he follows Ben's request to blink twice if he can see him is just beautiful. Ben and the boys head to the saloon, knowing who did it. Regan is being kowtowed to by the same one-winged drunk who was challenging him earlier. Ben demands Adam's gun and sends it down the length of the bar to the other end where Regan is leaning accompanied by a really great camera shot. Regan says he can't find the trigger with his busted up hand. So either you're telling me that he was already busted up and somehow he can still fist fight, or you're saying that he busted it up when he pummeled it in Joe's face. It's that, isn't it? He's rubbing it in how he beat Joe so bad that he hurt his hand. Yeah, you know what? Now I do want him dead. We're talking about an 18 or 19 year old boy against a man who is at least in his 40s and made his living in a way that Roy Coffey later describes as illegal weapon, having hands that are legal weapons. This guy can go skip a rock straight into the ocean and that's me trying to abide by YouTube's guidelines with my words. Hoss steps up to fight him instead and that makes a lot of sense with Hoss's size but Ben isn't able to think that way right now so Adam has to hold him back. The little man comes in one last time just to run away in fear. I thought the gag would get old, but it really didn't. I still love it. Hoss is losing pretty badly when Adam encourages him to switch sports and go from boxing to wrestling. The change turns the tide in his favor and he squeezes Regan against the bar and the idea of his ribs popping is just as satisfying to me as popping boba in my mouth. Just when my schadenfreude is at full peak, Ada comes in and pushes Hoss away. The look of pain on Ben's face when he watches a woman he loves tend to a man who stole from her and beat her for years and who has nearly blinded his own child kills me. She leaves with John and Ben goes back to his priority. He tends to Hoss's bloody face and then they go to look after Joe. I said at the start that I feel differently after watching this for the podcast than I used to. I think it's easy to be angry with Ada's choice and think that she's a fool. I used to be in that camp right with those people. I actually have more compassion for her now. When Ben asks her to marry him, she probably does consider how much better of a life she'd have with him. She's caught in this dance with Regan and she's not sure how to get out. She loves him in spite of it all. She's surrounded by fans of her work, yet she's all alone. Ben has sons and friends who love him, and he's built a life for himself that to Ada must feel so far out of reach. It is an act of compassion that she tries to sympathize with his sons and how they're feeling and doesn't want to get in the way of their family. Even if you don't subscribe to the idea that she might have been afraid she'd catch feelings for Adam, it'd be awkward at the family dinner table with your stepson, who you kissed that one time. In all seriousness, though, 
She still knows that she'd just be bringing trouble into their lives because of Regan. She's the definition of a tragic character, and I wholeheartedly hope that she didn't go back to John Regan after that. Ruth, Rom Ruth Roman plays Ada's character perfectly. She's strong and intelligent, yet her Achilles heel is her off-and-on romance with a violent wastrel of a man. As Ben says, there are as many kinds of love as there are women. Love doesn't fit in a neat little box. It cannot be explained, nor can it be changed once the heart is set on a course it must take at all costs. We can only hope that with time, we find the strength to chart a different path once we realize that a certain love has only brought us pain. This one also shows us again the healthy bonds of love between family who respect and support each other. I love this episode and totally recommend that you give it a watch if you haven't already.